I'm in the basement of the London Science Museum with Ben Russell, mechanical engineering curator, and we're about to take apart what just could be the world's oldest micrometer and look at things very few people have ever seen. We're trying to answer the question, who made this and when? I've been obsessed with this object for a few years now. The very first video I ever made for this channel was an introduction to the problems in history of precision and measurement. The video thumbnail is even a rendering of a CAD model I made for this micrometer, from largely just guessing at dimensions from a few old photographs I found. And then I started to make my own replica. If you watch that video, you'll get a better idea of how insanely important this may be. Micrometers can measure repeatedly to pretty high precision, well below the thickness of a sheet of paper, and this very device is likely to be the world's first micrometer for measuring physical objects at that kind of precision. If you had told me a few years ago I'd be holding the micrometer allegedly made by James Watt in my hands and taking it apart, it would have completely blown my mind. In my view, this is very possibly the first device to add a second or possibly a third decimal place to precision, which has mind-numbing implications. To be able to consistently work to that level of precision gives you the modern world. Almost everything in your life is dependent on the ability to measure very, very small distances. You'll notice I'm using a lot of weasel words implying we don't know if this is the first end measurement micrometer or who made it for sure, but our investigation today is to try and answer that question, and it's been a mystery for well over a hundred years. Even the Science Museum themselves say in their display reputedly for a good reason. Ben Russell, who also wrote a book on Watt, says the same. So let's do some forensic investigation and see what we can find out. Firstly, where did it come from and why does the museum have it? The museum came to have this object when they held a gigantic scientific conference of sorts called the Special Loan Collection of Scientific Apparatus in 1876. This was a gigantic affair when the museum brought together vast numbers of scientific instruments from around the world and had them all in one place for all to see. Scientists from everywhere could see what others were doing, and it was incredibly influential. Much to the amusement of me, their stated goal was to be more like the Conservatoire des Arts et Métiers in Paris, a place we have visited several times on this channel. The massive catalog for the exhibition is over a thousand pages long, and the exhibition showed over 20,000 artifacts at once, even more than the museum has on display today. Over a quarter of a million people came to see it, and it was a major cultural event. In that special loan collection, there were some special groups of objects, some of which came from the company descended from Bolton and Watt, and this micrometer is one of those objects and was presented as being made by James Watt. Now, just to dust off your history brain cells, James Watt is not the guy who invented the steam engine, but instead made it much more efficient, but also perhaps more importantly, with a wealthy partner, founded a company to produce the engines for sale. Watt is a giant of the Industrial Revolution, as he was able to put the actual power behind the huge explosion of wealth the new industries gave us. We all know that time is money, but power is money too. He's super famous and important, and there are statues of him everywhere all over Britain, not to mention being on the 50-pound note with his business partner Bolton. The problem is that there are about a hundred years between when Watt supposedly made it and it coming to public light. And even though there's extensive documentation on Watt and his businesses, if he did make it, he didn't tell anyone or write anything down about it. So why bring it to light at the special loan collection? One thought is Watt made it and never did much with it and just forgot about it. He was a prolific inventor, so perhaps this was just something he played with and was left with his company and continued to get passed down to the new owners. But there's another theory I've heard that's a little less generous. James Watt is undoubtedly one of the giants of his age. By the time the special loan collection happened, U-shaped micrometers had been independently invented by a Frenchman, Palmer, about 30 years prior to the collection. Palmer's patent was bought by the Americans Brown and Sharp, and now a similar handheld version was being sold, and these micrometers were making big waves. If you look through the catalog, there's dozens of devices which used screws for measuring small distances and all kinds of scientific devices. So, was this an attempt by someone to big up Watt, as it were, and show that Watt had invented yet another triumph well before anyone else? That's the question we're trying to answer today, as there is no provenance connecting it directly to Watt. Does it look like something invented and made in the 1770s? Does it look like Watt's hand? Could it have been made with the tools we knew he had? We don't know. Let's dig in. So how does it work? If you turn the small crank on the big back dial, it is fixed to a screw that runs along the middle. 
Riding on top of that is an anvil which can slide. Also, the screw drives a worm gear which turns the small dial. The back has 50 divisions, the small one 19. I've also seen pictures of the worm gear and I know it has 23 divisions, and the lead screw is about 18 threads per inch. So the first thing we can notice is that it's not decimal. What about this possibly being a forgery for the special loan collection? First, I'm going to say everything I say here is my opinion only. I'm by no manner a pro or have special training to say anything definitive about this. But I do think, having made projects for many years, I can start to infer some patterns. So first off, in my opinion, the object shows too much wear to likely have been constructed specifically for the exhibition and be passed off as Watts. We'll look into some of those areas in a moment. Does this look like the hand of Watt? This is where I get out of my depth very quickly, but that's not going to stop me from having some opinions. I think it shows areas where someone had both a lot of skill putting it together, and areas where it was not someone's finest work. Was this someone messing around? Was it just a prototype? Watt was an instrument maker before making steam engines, so he definitely was able to make gear to high standards. But did he always make everything to that standard? In no particular order, here are some of the things we notice when taking a closer look over about an hour and a half. Firstly, I'd never seen the back, and I don't think others had either, because in other replicas I've seen everybody gets it wrong. What you see here are the three posts which hold the small dial and come all the way through and then are pinned on the back. There's also what looks like a lot of hammer marks which don't seem to have anything to do with this part. I'm guessing those were from another project, and this makes me think this was originally a scrap piece of material, though I can only imagine for the time this would have been rather valuable. On the front, the small dial is soldered onto those standoffs which are pinned on the back. Speaking of the small dial, the hands have a brass bushing soldered into it and it's rotated off center. I bet that happened during the soldering process. On the big dial in back, there's a stray hole that doesn't seem to have any purpose. Again, it makes me wonder if this came from something else. On both dials, there is knurling or reading like on a coin around the outside edge. Why, if the rest of this is somewhat rough, would somebody put a decorative touch on this? Probably practice? Also on the large dial, there are what looks like extra circles cut or etched on both the front and back that serve no purpose, not even really decorative. Again, this makes me think that maybe this was practice, or possibly this piece was repurposed from another device. There's also a lot of faint, circular marks that makes it look like this dial's been turned many times. If you look at the graduated marks on the large dial, it appears they were made with some kind of dividing engine, at least at first. But if you look a little closer, you can see how there is variation in their size, so I believe this was likely indexed by hand. Also, it's hard to see in the photos, but sometimes the small in-between marks extend a little too far, but they are very straight, which suggests to me they were made in some kind of crossing out device like clockmakers use. When we remove the hand from the large dial, we immediately notice the large hands have some brass stock soldered into them, which sits proud of the hands themselves. Long before we got here, someone tried to remove the large back dial, but the screws wouldn't move much and the big dial was loose. We didn't dare try to remove them further. We then discovered something neither of us had noticed before. The main body dials and stand are all of brass, but the rest is made of wrought iron. If you look carefully, you can see the strata where the iron has been hammered over. This is especially true on the small fixed anvil where it's actually curved a bit. Does this suggest more 1770s than later? Maybe? One of the problems with trying to date things from this period is that it took technology sometimes decades to become ubiquitous, and like today, people with different skill or wealth levels have access to different methods. But personally, I think the wrought iron speaks to this being older than newer, relatively speaking. Let's flip it over and look at the bottom. We can see the accession number, the year of the collection when the micrometer was added to the museum's collections, 1876, and the item number, 1370. But we can also see the screws holding the base on, and they are terrible. I know this is a bad photo, but both slots are way off center. You can also barely see there's an extra hole just ahead of the rear one which was never used, that looks like a transfer punch mark was made on the main micrometer body to locate a hole that was never drilled. But also look at the quality of the outside base holes where the mounting screws would have been. They're terrible again. Not even close to round and very rough. It also looks like the holes are intentionally hand countersunk from the bottom and top, which is odd. There are countersunk screws on the back of the big dial, and they are much better done. Does this suggest two makers? When the micrometer is right side up, the base is actually a little shorter than the bottom of the U, so it sits a little crooked unless something is placed under it or it's off the edge of a table. Was it made later and someone screwed up the height? 
or was it intentionally made to sit off the side of a table? But either way, if we flip it over and look at the top, wouldn't we expect to see some evidence of screws that had held it down to something? Even if washers had been between a screw holding it down and the micrometer, or even countersunk screws, I would expect to see some marks. But we don't. What does this mean? Was this ever actually mounted on something? So now looking at the anvils that actually do the measuring, when we take them apart we start to see some really interesting stuff. I presume this is something only a handful have ever seen over the last couple hundred years. First, we notice the moving anvil has what looks like to me wear on the top and it's pretty uneven. This suggests that the bottom dovetail is not very flat or parallel. In my highly inexpert opinion, it seems to me like this item has actually been used a fair amount, though you can also see some stray file marks from the maker still. Back of the fixed anvil shows some hammer marks. What do those mean? Bottom of the moving anvil is very interesting too. We can see it's pretty rough with lots of file marks, but also notice how the threads seem wider in the middle and less at the ends. This says to me it's bowed. Also, notice that the area above the thread is filed down to clear the screw threads. This is obviously filed, not drilled, which to me suggests someone with older, cruder tools than something more modern. Comparing the flatness of the dovetail surfaces on a reasonably flat tabletop does show that indeed they are far from flat. The same with the bottom. Looking at the lead screw itself, though, it's fairly rough, but perhaps not too bad for the supposed time it was made. One thing that's really interesting to me is that there are what look like marks at either end that suggest it was held between centers on a lathe. Could many lathes the 1770s cut wrought iron like this? What kind of skill level did it take? I know there were small clock-making lathes, but I don't know if they were cutting iron, though I'm far from expert here. I'm not sure how common metal cutting lathes were with tailstocks on them. And then all you had was foot power. I think it suggests the threads were likely chased, which makes sense, but I still have so many questions here. So after looking at all this detail, what do you think? Was this made by James Watt in the 1770s? Was it made later? Who do you think made it? I want to hear what you think in the comments. Personally, I'm not yet drawing any conclusions. I think the evidence could go any number of directions and more work needs to be done. And again, anything I've said here is my opinion. Ben has only begun his investigation of this micrometer and he's far and away the expert here. He has an article coming out later this year and it should have much more detail based on closer inspection and doing much more advanced things like examining the metallurgy. Plus, he's going to compare this to other objects which are known to have been made by Watt so perhaps we can get a better idea of whose hand made this. If you haven't already, please subscribe and stick around. This story is far from over and I can't wait to get more into the history of machine tools and then actually making them. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.